Welcome to the Association 100 podcast. The A100 podcast is an extension of our Association 100 bi-monthly newsletter that focuses on best practices, top trends, helpful ideas, and smart strategies and tactics that work in the world of associations. The podcast will feature meaningful conversations with association professionals across the country, taking a deeper dive into trending topics, offering insights that both inform and inspire. Welcome back to the A100 podcast today. I'm Colleen Gallagher, and I'm joined by my co-host, Christine Stay. We're really excited for today's guest, Allegra Tasaki, who we're going to dive into a topic that is near and dear to our hearts as communicators and marketers. Allegra is a storyteller, a brand evangelist, and a content strategist. She is a self-described lifelong learner who is constantly seeking ways to refine her skills and become a better advocate for the causes she believes in. She has woven storytelling into the fabric of strategic marketing and association leadership, supporting mission-driven organizations to create positive change. She is also actively involved in ASAE, particularly with ASAE's Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Advisory Group, where she works with AANHPI leaders championing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and DEIA initiatives, and advocating for elevating the next generation of AANHPI professionals to leadership positions. We're so excited to dive into all things marketing, communications, and storytelling with her today. So Allegra, thank you for joining us on the A100. Thank you so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to having a conversation. Yeah, so are we. So you've been recognized for your innovative approach to blending storytelling with strategic marketing in the nonprofit sector. Can you share a bit about how you've leveraged the latest technologies to craft impactful strategies that really drive organizational capacity? Yeah, it's really interesting. I know a lot of people would say AI, <laughs> but I think that's <laughs> only because we're at that nascent stage of developing a lot of technologies that use AI to accelerate production, put out new ideas, those kinds of things. I don't think that it's really about the tech so much as it is the reasons why we use it, um, purposes behind that. Things like a Marcom tech stack, you have the basics, email, SMS, delivery platforms, CRMs, ABCs, one, two, threes, right down the line, right? I think that it's really more important about starting with the mission of the organization and the reason why you're going to use that technology rather than, okay, here's a whole bunch of pieces of technology we're going to use, or I'm going to use AI to help me develop this content. That's putting the cart before the horse. So I think it's better to think of it as we need to have our data as accessible as possible across a number of different platforms. And if I had to pick a piece of tech, it would really be a, a class of tech. And that would be integrators. Because those things are the things that pull all of your data together in those wonderful dashboards. They're the things that enable you to really look into what your data is telling you. What are your data stories? Is it saying go in one direction, another direction? Is it saying the campaign you did failed because it was in the wrong channel? It was at the wrong time? Or maybe you had the wrong influencer? So I think that taking a look at it from the standpoint of being able to access disparate kinds of data from a number of different sources and being able to pull that into one data story dashboard, that's what's going to be really key. And I think, honestly, AI is definitely a huge part of that. Right. I love the pulling it together, though, because we've talked about data on this podcast before, and there's such a wealth of it. There's so much, but you have so many cases where associations are say, OK, we've got all this data. We're not doing anything with it because we don't know what it means. Yes. What does it mean? And where should we head based on that? I love being thoughtful about that, definitely. Yes. Now, engaging diverse stakeholders is crucial for any organization. What are some of your key strategies for crafting messages that can resonate with a wide audience, including customers, policymakers, sponsors, the media? For a long time, marketers really only discussed segmentation. We're going to segment our target audiences. And that is a very strong base of 
everything as a communications and marketing person, that's where you start. But with AI and other kinds of technology, there's an opportunity to expand on that. And I was at Superform last week, and I think we geeked out for about an hour. I was talking to a couple of different uh, vendors or tech providers. And an hour goes by quickly when you're talking with other people who are passionate about this. And we were talking about, when it comes down to it, technologies that are in the adaptive personalization space. So anything that AI can help you continuously learn from customer interactions and behaviors in a dynamic fashion and pull that together is going to help you create those personal experiences over time. It used to be really super manual that we would have to do that. Surveys, focus groups, polls, those kinds of things, drip campaign, and those still all have a place. The question really becomes what methodology do you use and at what point in your year cycle do you use it to gain the optimal data from that so you have a better, clearer picture of the behaviors of your prospective target audience members, your current ones, and even the ones who are no longer with you so that you can have really a personalized approach that goes just beyond the customization of so-and-so attended this conference. So we're going to market to that person or so-and-so just they're a mailbox member. They'll renew no matter what. But when you can actually attach more information to that person's name and reach them on a more personal level, I, I think that's really where long-term sustainability for any organization comes into play. And I think through adaptive personalization, um, you can really build those relationships because that's what it's all about, right? People want relationships. They don't care about the tech. They want to feel that they belong to a special organization or that they're supporting an important cause or mission. And so I think that's really going to be key in the future. We've started to build on that, but there's a long way to go. No, agreed. And talking about you can get this plethora of data now, which is fantastic, this data and research. But what is your process in turning that data and research into creative, compelling content? That's a really good question. A lot of people just take these, here's my membership report. Here's my communications report. I've seen communication reports where they'll talk about number of visitors to the website, how many people engage with their social media, but it's not benchmarked against anything. And so benchmarking is a really big storytelling piece of it, right? You can have all kinds of numbers and they can say a number of different stories and people can make the numbers tell a certain story. Um, infographics, they're great for that. But I think I'm more inclined to think of data as combination of pieces of a puzzle that as you start to put them together, things become clearer. And when you start with the mission of the organization, the why of sharing a story becomes a lot clearer. It takes shape with the data that you put together to create and communicate that message. Sometimes it's numbers, sometimes it's video. It can be any piece of data that's out there. It generally tends to be like in marketing and communication. It's always a combination of things. And I'm thinking of at one point, I worked with an educational focused association and we get seven different target audiences. One of them was a design piece. Another was you know, an architect piece. And the conference that we would market every year would have all the people on an educational facilities team invited to the conference so that they could see what the next generation of classrooms and universities and learning spaces would be. And telling that story is not a simple process. It's a multi-step process, multi-channel process. But we had someone from a school come to the conference and they took the three days. They literally sat down in our booth with their blueprints, their architect, their designer, and, a, and they would invite vendors so that they could ask questions in our booth. And 
what they did was they mapped out their entire year's budget of purchases and planning for their school right there in three days. What would normally take us crazy to nine months. Yeah. Six to nine month process wow. was done in three days. They didn't have to do. They cut their travel budget by two thirds. And wow. Yeah. So that's a lot of data and story kind of coming together. But the best part of it was the design firm and the architect worked together to capture that. And we scripted out a video and we had a little mini documentary, if you will to share that process with the other target audience members. And so we did a you know combination of a drip campaign at the beginning of the next sales cycle. But what it was is that it, it captured what happened, the experience, the relationships that you gain when you're in person and you're able to ask questions and get those answers in real time and not have to follow up electronically. And it was one of our most successful multi-channel campaigns. We had a 10% year over year increase in registration in the first three months. Three that months. speaks volumes. Yeah, that says a lot right there. I was really, you know, it's it just, and that's really, I think for me too, where video and understanding reasons behind doing that became more um, a part of the strategy process. I can tell you that you're speaking Christine's love language when you keep mentioning the mission of an association. I, I was just thinking that. Because how many podcasts have we had? And it always comes back to that. It always comes back to the mission statement. Yeah. So that is my love language. Yes. <laughs> the other piece I want to come back to so it doesn't get lost that I felt was really valuable that you said at the beginning of that answer was the benchmarking piece. Myself, having worked in associations for years and having to deliver reports like that to senior leaders and board members and now being on the consultant side, I always tell my team, you can't just give someone numbers and expect them to know what to do with it. You have to tell a story. You have to have something for them to compare it to, something for them to say, this is good or this is bad and actually know why. So that is so important for anyone trying to communicate something like that to a stakeholder. Yeah, that's a really good point because I look at it from benchmarking. You benchmark against your data. You benchmark against your data year over year or season over season. I, I like to do it on a qu quarterly basis. But you also benchmark it against the industry standard because it gives you a sense of where you exist in the space. And every organization that I've worked with, I've had to set up those benchmarking dashboards because it's not understood about why we're moving in a direction that we, we're moving. You could say, oh, big, great strategy. But what is supporting that strategy is the benchmarking. Yeah, 100%. So I want to shift gears a little bit, looking at your LinkedIn and your website as we were preparing for the conversation today, I can tell that volunteering is clearly something that matters a lot to you. I saw you volunteered with several nonprofits on an ASAE committee. So I'd love to know how giving back to the professional community has influenced your work and leadership style. It's funny. It's giving back, but I get a lot from it. I've got to be really candid about that, whether it's for charity or if it's with a professional organization, you're always getting something out of it. And so I'm always looking for a way to contribute. I served on the ASAE Gold Circle Awards Committee for the past three years. And it was shepherded by Carrie, Diana, and Maria on those three different years. And each of them has a different leadership style and different speaking abilities and things like that. And so I took that time and I didn't realize it at the time when I first started, but I, I caught myself doing it to observe and watch and see how they were leading in that capacity because I wanted to model my leadership after women leaders, not after male leaders, because our executive presence is very different from what we could do if we were men. And there are pluses and minuses to that. And each one of these women, actually, I took a little something from each one of them to apply to my own style. One thing that I will say that all three of them do really is that they respect the time that volunteers put in. So they plan in advance. Nothing is last minute. Everything is in advance. And 
there's a lot of grace given because sometimes even when you plan things in advance, things don't always work out the way you expect. And having that being so respectful of people's time and planning ahead of time allowed for two things. One, it allowed for a space to ask questions. Like sometimes you don't feel comfortable asking a question in front of your whole group. But because they were so good at planning and they were respectful, there was always a little time at the end where if you stayed on that call a little later, you could then ask the question that maybe you weren't so comfortable asking before. And the other thing that I took from them is this concept of giving grace. We are always hardest on ourselves. And sometimes when we do that, we can be really judgmental, especially to other women. And none of these women do that. And so to be in their presence and to really lean into being true to yourself and following their example of giving grace and not making assumptions was huge. Because at one point, I'm always bound to make a mistake. I, I don't have a problem with people saying, hey, that wasn't quite right, or I didn't like the way you approached this. Not everyone is comfortable doing that. I try to make those opportunities and keep that door open, right? But I'm not always successful with that, but I will tell you, I learned a lot from these women on that committee. And those are some leadership qualities I think as women can be really impactful over the long term. That really hits home. It's funny when my co-founder Megan Henry and I started Onward and Upward, about six months in, we had a really important decision to make. And we had some of our old bosses we'd reach out to. And some of it is trusting yourself and trusting your gut. Yeah. Because all of their advice, it was not what we wanted to do and we, what we thought was right. And at one point we said to each other, we're really good at this. And they're all men. Maybe our instincts are the way to go. And that's not the only way to do it. And we went in our direction and boy, did it pay off for us. So I'm so glad. And it, it's hard to turn that trust in yourself on you. You're so much more willing to trust other people than yourself. Like you said, in terms of giving grace too, it's the same with trust. So it's a big piece as women leaders. I think that's really important. And it's hard to find women leaders. For me, it was hard for many years to find women leaders that I could trust enough and also trusted me enough to be honest, candid, and share their opinions. You made a really good point. Men do things a different way than we do. They don't think the way that we do. And that's not a bad thing. Some of those strategies work, but they don't always work for us. That's... Or it's you're trying to fit this octagon peg in a round hole. It works, but it's not optimized. And so that's why I've been watching women leaders all over the place. <laughs> Cribbing and asking questions. I just, I'm still learning a lot. Are we all? <laughs> so I could talk about that all day with you, but I want to talk about something I've heard you highlight on a couple of your other podcast appearances. And so that's the importance of marketing and engagement strategies. I'd love if you have an example or something you can share that really exemplifies this approach and, and its impact that it can have on engagement. Yeah, I'm a, oh boy. Don't tell my dad. But. My father's saying is that the three P's of life are planning, planning, and planning. And the only way to be strategic really is to follow the three P's of life. Hopefully he won't hear that because he will never let me live it down. So one of the things that I've had to do in every job that I've ever held is that piece of it, is the planning and the strategy part of it. So every organization that I've worked with that I've served has needed to have an integrated marketing and communications plan put together and shared and adopted, edited, refined to fit the needs of that organization. And I mentioned that mini documentary because it shows the impact of one of those strategies and that takes a lot of planning to put in place. But another area would be like an illegal association where I worked where they had never used video as a part of their strategy. And so the planning piece of it was to take a look at who were the influencers in this space, because it's gonna be different for every organization, and to find out if they would be open to doing that and testing it out and piloting it. And so 
for the first time ever, we implemented a series of video shorts that featured influencers in the space, put it into a drip campaign for social and also on the website and in email campaigns. And it was to promote, just to test it out on this one flagship conference because it was coming out of COVID and it was going to be the first time in person and it was going to be a hybrid, but it was the first time that they were meeting in person. And I was a little nervous because I was new to the group. I didn't know all the key players really well. I was able to identify them, but these are really busy people. They're lawyers. They charge by the 15 minute. They charge by the quarter hour. So I took all the lessons I learned about intention and being respectful of people's time from Gold Circle. I literally was like, okay, I'm going to do exactly what these women leaders did. And I'm going to map this stuff out. I'm going to do it on a monthly and quarterly basis. And then I'm going to share the chunks out with each of the influencers ahead of time so they know what to expect. And pull together bullets that give a little toolkit. So bullets for their video tips on how to shoot at the best because it's consumable content that isn't going to be a long shelf life. It would be used in free promotion, but not really going to be working for future promotion because every conference has a different set of topics. And so pulling those kinds of things together, really, for the first time ever, it, you're walking into unknown territory. And if there were a way to pretest everything before you actually deploy it, I would be really happy. But there just isn't. So I had to introduce myself to people and ask them for feedback. And I had to do it really quickly. So there was a week where I was working like 12-hour days so that I could get the planning process together. And because you can't go back in time and market, I had to get planning and the strategy together. Then I needed to create all of the communications that go along with that so that it could be approved internally and then deployed to the influencers in the space. But it was a whole process. And so to give everyone the overview of the process and then their roles in it, that takes a lot of work, right? And so pulling all that together, long story short, was respectful of people's time, but it also allowed for once the planning piece of it was done, really fast implementation. And so when we dropped the first of the series, it was a series of, we were originally going to do three, we ended up doing four because within the first 48 hours of the first drop, registrations increased. It was like a double over what it had been in past years. And that was even like pre-pandemic. So it wasn't a lot, but it was still from registration opening to dropping of this campaign within 48 hours, it doubled. So that was a great way to start that whole process. The thing about getting that earlier in that sales cycle, doing that earlier in the sales cycle, what it'll do is it, it affects everything else you do. You can then start predicting your F and B and accounting for other expenses ahead of time so that you're not getting overcharged. You can alert your other teams to let them know what's happening. But it also, just even from a financial standpoint, that's interest that sits in the bank, oh, you know, that grows as your registration grows. So thinking of things in terms of not just being an isolated campaign, but understanding where it fits in to the overall messaging and your attendee base, your target audience base, as well as pulling in all of your social influencers, all of those things bleed out to other things. It's like that drop in the pond and those concentric circles are the effects from those actions. My other love language is planning. I love your dad saying, and there's nothing better than to get that point done and just be done with that part of it. Because then, like you said, fast implementation and just, it's so nice when that can go smoothly. So I get that. And you were talking about social influencers and that will pivot into the digital landscape and about how it's rapidly evolving all the time. How can associations ensure that their content strategy remains effective and engaging across all channels, especially expanding with social media networks and building online communities? Yeah, that's as marketing or communications professionals, we're, we're always thinking about engagement across all channels, but there's a big lesson that I learned, and that is it's important to limit the channels. 
to the ones that fit the organization's mission and culture the most. So it might not be really relevant for a professional membership organization to have an Instagram account unless it's for a specific purpose. Like maybe it's for early career professionals or student membership, or it's surrounding a regional conference. That would make more sense. But to have something that's out there just because it's for the group doesn't necessarily send the right message to the right people at the right time. It's a little different if you're working with an environmental group or humanitarian group. Those groups have very physically graphical stories to tell. And those stories can be told in little tiny chapters to create the book of communications that they want to share with their target audiences. They could be other professionals. They could be donors, funders, whatever it happens to be. But that's different. So you got to know your group, your organization, and its own culture. Some of that can be generational and how that ties into the organization's mission. It always comes back to the mission. It always does. It's set up understanding what stories from our proverbial trenches resonate with our target audiences is really important. So Insta might be great for a specific initiative or a specific personal group of people, but it might not necessarily be something that's organization-wide. Content strategy in, by nature is really defining about what channels work best and why. That's where your benchmarking comes in that metrics evaluation, as well as looking at assessing sentiment in the space. Some of the social stuff can do that, but you can get that too. Now with AI, there's some new tools that are coming out through bots and things like that to have a sense of the sentiment around certain topics, your organization's mission, position in the global space. So I just look at those things at a number of different platforms and try to pull that into one data story so that you can have a better sense of what's going to work. What's the cadence? Where is it in the cycle of your sales cycle? Does that make sense? Love the audience centric approach. And I, I always say you can't have communications goals that don't come back to business goals. But another big thing that associations don't always think about is their limited resources. I can't tell you how many associations say to me, we should be on TikTok now. And I just look at them and I say, Audience aside, do you know the amount of time and energy and resources it takes to run a TikTok account? (laughs) And they have no idea. They don't. I know because a friend of mine is a TikToker and (laughs) we don't run this all the time. We could geek out. I think we had a two hour conversation the other day. So, yeah, it is producing media is not very efficient. I think I've got it down to a science now. You have to think about what media is going to be consumed by whom, how, when, why, cadence and everything. But like, how long a shelf life does it have? Do you really need to have the top level of production value? Probably not. But you still want to look professional. And there are a number of ways you can do that in a cost-effective and time-effective way. Yeah, I love the idea of being thoughtful and not doing something just for the sake of doing it. Because especially with associations, you don't have time. Like there's so many hats everybody's wearing and you just don't have time for that. I think that's a really good point. That from a planning and, girl. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Now let's talk a little bit about metrics. They obviously play a significant role. How do you balance quantitative data with qualitative aspects of storytelling to measure the success of your campaigns? And we talked a little bit about that before, but I'd love to know a little bit more. So I got a funny story. We love funny stories. <laughs> so this is before GA4 was fully implemented. So they were, you still at UA, you don't still GA. It was back and forth. You're just looking at all this different data. I personally think GA4 is all about tracking ads, but whatever. At least you have something, right? I liked UA a lot better. But that said, there was a former marketing staffer who was really excited about the traffic that was going to the site. and. When they said the numbers, I was like, that doesn't seem right because the numbers were huge. I was like, oh, that's great. It sounds really good. And then two seconds later, I was like, wait a minute. 
that's not matching up with the 2,500 members we have and maybe an additional 2,500 outside of that of adjacent target audiences. So I went into the platform and I was looking at it. It turns out I always ignored it. I guess I just wasn't paying attention to it, but the UA platform at one point was putting out test accounts under your account. And it was the one that appeared at the top, always. Now I had shut this off in previous organizations, so it didn't appear. I had seen it and it vaguely was ticking something off in my brain. But when I went and looked at it and saw the numbers, those were the numbers that the staff person was saying. And I went, oh, get this. I could not turn it off. I couldn't oh, try no. the campaign. I couldn't turn it on. All you had to do was select the correct account under your GA account, right? The campaign. Is. And, nope. and I tried to even make that one pop up to the top, at the top of the feed. And it just, they didn't allow that. They had turned off so many things in UA because within months, they were going to be completely abandoning it. Product growth. So... The numbers were really off and I looked at it and I looked at the numbers we actually had and I had to go back and say, okay, so those weren't really our numbers. It's not your fault. These things happen. This is what the situation was. And so that's why I was saying earlier, numbers only tell half the story. And the numbers in isolation are only a piece of that story. You have to have the comparative benchmarking to understand what your story actually is. And it has to be year over year at a minimum. Usually it's good to see on a biannual basis, three years of comparative numbers and also the comparative numbers in this space for that period in the cycle. And so that's the numbers piece of it. But the other side of it, the qualitative side of it is what are the numbers saying are working? And that's where the why comes in. They're working because guess what? We've never run video before. And now all of a sudden, everyone's engaging. And if you take a look at where your behavioral traffic patterns are on your website, they come in on that first page. What they click on first? Video. So you can follow those patterns, those behavioral patterns, from your email clicks to your website, to your social, those kinds of things. And then that's what tells you the story. Where's the entry point that people are coming in and what number of people were being reached at the time, at what time of day and what time of the week and what point in the sales cycle. Those are pieces of data that if you put them all into a story, oh, guess what? When we drop a video on Friday afternoon at 2.35 p.m., we're going to get twice as many eyeballs on it as we would and registrations as we would if we dropped it on a Monday at 9 a.m. Or guess what? All those times that you thought a sat Saturday email wouldn't work, people have been engaging with it and the steady traffic has been um, upticking. So... Marrying those two things together, that's how, those are the stories that come out of that. And I think those are the stories that are going to be really important, especially when you look at AI and looking at those personal experiences. Yeah, that's so helpful and just such good insights around that. I do want to come back to your volunteer work a little bit before we jump into our lightning round here. And I have a question first I should have asked before. Justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. How do we say that? Is that J-E-D-I or Jedi? <laughs> So my friends in California, we always call it dead eye. I think it depends okay. on where you are. I say dead eye. <laughs> I was just I went straight I to it. Star Wars in my mind. Yeah, Star I don't Wars. Know why, but that's what I was thinking. Leia was a woman leader. I love it. I would love to hear more about your involvement with that ASAE AA and HPI advisory group, what it means to you personally and the goals that you're working towards when it comes to championing those Jedi and DEIA initiatives. If you must have been talking to Wendy. Did she tell you about the time I was chasing her down the hall? No, no, do tell. I, we love Wendy, by the way. One of our we best do. episodes. She yeah. was, I was at an ASAE meeting. This was like pre-pandemic, so it was years ago. And I'm first-generation Japanese. 
And I had seen, I'd seen a couple people of Asian descent, but it had been a long time. And I saw her in one of the corridors. I was literally running down the hall. People thought I was like late to a session or something. I'm running down the hall and I couldn't remember her name. I'm running, I'm thinking, oh, what is her name? And I catch up here and I'm like, out of breath. And I, and I said, hey, I'm Allegra Tasaki. And I know that your last name is also from Japanese descent. Turns out she's Okinawan. But I just wanted to meet you and say hello. And she looked at me and she was like, what? <laughs> I don't know you. you. But then she realized, oh, wait a minute. This is someone who's seeing themselves here at this conference where you don't see a lot of others. And when you fast forward a couple of years, she was the one who actually is one of the founding leaders of the group, along with Don D. And she suggested that I be a part of the group. And for the first time in my entire professional life, I found a flock. It's a big, very diverse group. But there are certain Asian traditions and customs that run across the, the whole group. And so being a part of that has been, for me, very personally gratifying because I've never been around others in the space. And a couple of years ago, at an ASAE conference, I, for the first time in my life, had dinner with not one, not two, but three Asian CEOs. And I was, I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And so being a part of this group is like coming home because there are things that we just know about each other the way that we relate to each other, that are culturally aware and sensitive. And it's just a nice place to learn and, and grow and be mentored. Because I've never had that. I'm old. I've been doing this for over 20 years. And this is the first time that I've had a mentor in a long time. I had one other mentor. And this is the first time where I've actually had this collective a uh, group of mentors that are there guiding me along the way. And so the best part of it is that as Asians, that planning thing is definitely, I would say, a cultural thing. And the group had put together a strategic plan. We mapped that strategic plan to AASAE's strategic plan because a lot of those goals clearly aligned. And now we're mapping the things that we've accomplished in these two years to those uh, goals. And I really enjoyed that. It's, it's part of it is the thinking exercise, the strategy exercise part of it. The other part of it is this continuous, that continuous learning piece of it and hearing um, feedback from others and really positive feedback from others. Things that I just hadn't heard before and I'm just really excited. The groups doubled in size. We're tiny, but we're mighty. I was going to say tiny but mighty. That sounds exactly it. And that just warms my heart. I love hearing these stories. And this is why DEIA is so beneficial and so needed. And I just love hearing that. It's great because we have other groups out there and we're coordinating different events and different things. But we also envision ourselves more as leaders collectively because we're working with each other. We've had that opportunity to, to really discover the leadership within ourselves individually. So it's a really great experience to have. Our listeners have definitely got a great sense of the type of person you are. I know that me and Colleen have, but we always end our podcast with a little bit of a lightning round style of questions. So the listeners get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. So I'm just going to shoot them off. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Northern California. I lived all over the state. My background is an interesting kind of mismatch of things. My parents had divorced when I was very young. And so we had some tough times. So I have lived in Southern California, Northern California. The last place I lived was in Northern California in the wine country. So yeah, I'm a wine Ooh. snot. 
I love it. What would be your Starbucks order in the morning? So I'm not much of a morning person. Oh, really? I'm with you. Same. I'll yep. do the coffee at home, but I like to have brunch at Starbucks. They have those great breakfast sandwiches. They are so good. That smoked Gouda, Black Forest ham, crust yep. thing. That is the best lunch ever. So that is my order. But I have to time it because they stopped serving them at 11. Yes. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So if you were going to win the lottery tomorrow, would you still work? Oh, yeah. I really like working. People always say, oh, I want to retire, I want to retire. That's not true. Including my parents are retired, but they're the busiest people in the world. They do all kinds of things. And I think I take after them. I used to think about starting a nonprofit. But I think when I would do, if I won the lottery, I have five that I've thought of. Nonprofits, that, a humanitarian organizations that I would want to fund. And I would want to do it with a cause-related approach. Oh, I love that. I love the thought you've put into that and that you have your five. That's amazing. I got my five. What was the, la the last show that you binge watched? And if it's not a show, uh, it could be a book also that you last binged. So I've now caught up on Shogun. And I wasn't going to watch it. When I read the book. I think I was in high school when I read the book. I saw the first one done. What was that in the 80s or whatever? So that tells you how old I am. But this production is really good. And I learned something. I was like, why is it that the word, I am not fluent in Japanese, but there are certain things that I know. And there were words that they were using that I didn't recognize. I, I, I couldn't understand. I was, what is this? And then my husband told me, reading up on the show, they were using 16th century style Japanese, not modern Japanese. That's so, so cool. it was like so interesting. Japanese. Oh, yeah. So they're very authentic when they're doing this. I've heard wonderful things about it. I heard the actresses are amazing. They too. really are. It's funny. As I watch Japanese actors in a number of different productions, there's a lot of very subtle facial expressions. They are the consummate actors from that perspective. You know how some people, they have physical comedy or they have a certain type. But one thing I will say about Japanese actors, it's all in the facial expressions and just a slight change in tone. And even in 16th century Japanese, you can tell. That's so cool. What's a food that you couldn't live without? I'm mixed heritage and I, I have two foods. One, of course, is going to be sushi. Oh, yep. Which, if I was stranded on a desert island because my plane crashed, not a problem for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then the other is the Italian heritage. So I would have a really hard time living without pasta. But pasta, as we all know, invented by the Chinese. So it's all it back all to age. I was going to say, yep, full circle. <laughs> and lastly, what's a bucket list travel destination for you? I want to go back to Pompeii. Oh, we were there. It was really hot. I love hot summers. My family hates them. But I was like in my summer swim dress with my hair all wet and slicked back in a pony. We were there and it was really hot. As a family, my, my parents came and then my kids and my husband and I were all there. And we didn't get to cover the whole thing. And we were there for six hours. They wow. just revealed the existence of new frescoes and i saw it in the post the background of the frescoes is in black because the oil the lamps that they would use would stain the walls so if they just painted it black then they didn't have to worry about cleaning it so much that was the one thing that stuck in my head aside from the fact that the frescoes are really super clear and vibrant it was just amazing and I remember seeing the House of the Fawn. I think it's called the House of the Dancing Fawn. That statue looked brand new. It looked like it could be featured at some posh hotel. It was amazing. And it was in this room that had Harlequin diamond mosaic floor. Very precise. I took a bunch of pictures of it. I just couldn't stop looking at it. I must have. We walked all over, but I definitely want to go back. I would love to see those. Movies. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's so cool. That's a place on my list for sure. It's amazing. I've heard people say it's better to go in the winter time. So maybe I would do that. I don't know. I like the heat like you, so I'd probably be fine in the summer. <laughs> and you can't find a bad meal. You could try. Touche. Awesome. Allegra, this was so much fun and just so valuable. I loved everything you had to say today. So thank you. We, we genuinely appreciate your insights. And I know our listeners will just, just take so much away from this episode. Uh, I really appreciate your time. As I said, I could geek out on this stuff for hours. I did last week. And so this was a lot of fun. And it's always great to connect with people who have the same planning and messaging values that you do. Yay! Thank you. Yeah, the passion, the, definitely the passion. I love it. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much. And that's a wrap on today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Association 100 podcast brought to you by the A100 publishing team powered by Onward and Upward Marketing and Communications. You can subscribe to the Association 100 podcast on Spotify so you'll never miss out. Or listen via our website at theassociation100.com. Follow us for all the latest insights and trends impacting the world of associations. Thanks for tuning in.